Welcome to the Governance and Audit Committee of Tuesday, the 24th of August. Um, if we can start with apologies for absence, please. No apologies, Chair. Um, could I ask for any disclosures of interest? No disclosures. Terry, Terry's got his hand up. Terry, you've got your hand up. Oh, sorry, I've asked the question. I'll take it down now. Okay, then. Thank, thank you, Councillor Hen, again. Um, the majority of the, the agenda is to, to present the accounts for information before it goes for, forward to the council for approval. Um, so we'll start with the statement of accounts. I'm not quite sure who's going to present this. Is it um, you, Ben, or is Amanda in? Chair, it will be me presenting the accounts, but I think the leader wished to speak first on the matter before I go into officer technicals on the report, if I may. Okay then, Rob, can I invite you to comment then? Yes, yeah, certainly, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, obviously begin by uh, paying tribute to Mr Smith and his team in terms of uh, providing the, the statement of accounts. Um, as members will know, it's been an incredibly traumatic year for every department in the council, not less um, the, the finance department who have done a sterling job, not only in ensuring that we deliver ahead of schedule, um, all of our uh, detailed accounts, but also, of course, making sure that we provide the financial support that's required to the, the businesses in Swansea, you know, to some £200 million worth of support that has been provided out to businesses uh, and communities in Swansea to help them through the pandemic. So to have maintained the position where they are ahead of schedule and, and ahead of the deadlines, uh, which is not something every uh, authority or body has been able to do, um, is a real tribute to the work that Mr Smith and his officers have done. I would also say that obviously, I'm sure when we come to the technical elements of this, uh, Mr Smith will go into details uh, around the technical qualification. But uh, again, uh, you know, given that we are in a position where we've outturned a £51 million surplus, which I think is a record for this authority, and the fact that that uh, technical qualification, as I understand it, goes dates back to some 2010-11. Um, it is a long burner, which has been there for some times. And whilst it's perfectly appropriate, I'm sure, as Mr Smith will say, for the um, the auditor to pick up the the technical qualification, uh, Mr Smith will give you details as to to why it's it's not um, a significant one and why it's one that Mr Smith is is working with his officers to resolve. But as I, as I said, I wanted to put the context in their early days. That this, of course, is one that's been in existence and been uh, uh, we've been aware of for some ten years or more. So it's one that uh, I'm sure Mr. Smith will help with. But I just I'm sure members will join me in in thanking Mr. Smith and his officers again for the sterling work that they've done. Thank you, Rob. I, I totally agree with those comments. It's it's uh, amazing the, the work that's been done in such difficult times, and you know Ben and his team have kept us updated right throughout the period as to the financial position. So yeah, I would I would echo the, the, those uh, comments. Fantastic job, Ben. Okay, would you like to um, take us through the accounts then, Ben? Yes, thank thank you, Chair, and thank you, Leader, for for for, for your comments. Um, the report itself is the short item because it's only a couple of pages. The covering report is fairly self-explanatory and reminds you of the key dates. And clearly Appendix A is the main event for consideration. As the legal officer has said, it's for questioning and comment and consideration, but no, no approval required because that matter is reserved to council. I do appreciate that an electronic review of a ginormous document uh, is never easy. So I will intend to canter through and draw your attention to the main items. Uh, the format is broadly the same as last year with some COVID special declarations in this year. I equally must pay tribute to the efforts of all my staff and non-financial colleagues who have worked in the most trying of circumstances to get a professional technical document delivered on time. But as has already been noted, there are going to be some difficult matters for you to consider when it comes to the auditor's report. My view is the quality and timeliness remains excellent. Um, and there is this long-standing matter which we will um, talk about in due course. And I will reserve some of my views until they get the opportunity to present their report. In terms of the main accounts in front of you, I'm going to attempt to share screen and jump to a couple of relevant pages. And I'm going to be using the committee page X format rather than the page numbers in the statement of accounts because it's part of a wider bundle. So I'm hopefully going to crank up the difference engine. Um, and get a relevant page up. I am hoping 
that you can see something on screen, but do holler if you can't. Can colleagues see um, a narrative report screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> thank you for confirming that. Um, I won't necessarily be able to see you whilst I'm speaking. So with your forbearance, I shall speak at probably for about 10 minutes on the main items and then we'll switch the screen off with your permission, Chair. Yes. It's a very long, complex document, the Statement of Counts, as it always is, but you should, those of you that are routinely on the Audit Committee, recognise it as in broadly the same format as, as usual is. And as I say, I'll draw your attention to some of the COVID issues in particular and the, the technical matter in due course. The narrative report on page 10, which is displayed on the screen, is probably the most useful item because it boils it down to a single page. And it's in exactly the same format as usual, but if I hover my cursor, you will note that sort of figure of 903 million is several hundred million pounds more than a normal year because of what I'm going to refer to as the COVID flex. Um, in normal convention, it shows where the money came from, what we spent it on and which directorate spent it on. And you'll see several references in this one, the reserve transfers at 55.6 million. Now, again, one of the difficulties with the statement of accounts as a technical document is there's 101 ways of measuring the reserves. This one includes some of the movements on uh, some of the more technical reserves as well. So you may see slightly different conventions, but the message to take away for all is that on any measure, and this is also referenced in the Financial Resilience Report, over £50 million was added to reserves. When I took the draft out turn to Cabinet, I said that's never happened in this authority's history, and good luck if anyone manages to deliver that again. I think it is unprecedented and clearly helps bolster the financial resilience, which you will um, hear from the external auditor in due course. If I scroll down, the narrative report is in normal sort of format. But again, as I'm hovering on the screen, that table there with nearly 200 million pounds worth of extra costs and most of it coming back in, which indicates the relative generosity of the Welsh Government, shows the sheer amount of COVID flex. I had no more staff, uh, no more activity, but we, we know we swelled the organisation mostly as an agent for Welsh Government, but we managed to stretch and deliver another £200 million worth of various support packages to a whole raft of companies, businesses, individuals, etc. So that just shows the sheer scale of it. And I think that's probably the most important thing for you to take away from the statement of accounts. No one expects you to be an expert. They expect you to read it through. Does it feel like what you would expect? If there are any unusual bits, why are they unusual? <clears throat> in similar vein, I'm now scrolling down to page 14, which shows the capital on a page, the second most useful page in terms of summarising everything for your average reader of the accounts. Um, again, same convention, where the money came from, what we spent it on. Again, draw your attention, £200 million plus, a record for this authority, entirely consistent with the outturn report, but it shows how it was financed, what we spent it on by directorate and then the big scale of spending and you'll see the items you would expect to see in there, including the unusual ones where we built the Bay Studio Surge Hospital and then transferred over to the health authority because we were using our spend power to help out both the local health board and the Welsh government were delivering on the ground before others were able to recompense us. Uh, if I scroll down to page 17 you will see in here a whole raft of disclosures around uncertainties because of COVID, um, but also referencing the already agreed at Cabinet um, £20 million locally recovery fund, which is effectively part of the dividend of the £50 million plus surplus that I referred to previously. If I go down to page 21 next, and again using the page 21 convention, uh, this is one of the unfortunate. I'm trying to avoid the ones that require you all to tilt your head at a funny angle to read them. That's the worst part about an electronic document, isn't it? But that's the income and expenditure account, which shows quite clearly, albeit you may have to tilt your head somewhat, <clears throat> the um, sheer surplus that was achieved in the year. And again, the eagle eyed will spot that some statements have slightly different measures and conventions of the reserves, but overall they are entirely consistent with each other, which is what you're looking for in the statement. So I'm not going to stretch people's necks too much on that one, but I'm going to draw your attention next to page 28. Again, another unfortunate one is just the way it fits on the page. Um, you will see an, an item around transfers to and from earmarked reserves. So you see the 50 million pounds of general fund reserves there. You see 
um, a range of other entries in there in terms of the movements on the individual reserves. And I will reserve my comments on reserves themselves until we get back to a page in portrait rather than uh, landscape just to uh, rescue my neck as much as anyone else's in terms of the next strain. Page 31 next, <clears throat> a summary of the balance sheet. Um, the balance sheet, again, you should broadly recognise it in normal format, and I wish to draw your attention. Given that we're spending a couple hundred million pounds worth of capital and things are added to and things are written down, no major surprise that the overall long term assets have gone up by 150 million pounds in value. Value is different to the spend in some cases, and there will be depreciation on the assets, but you can see long term assets up materially. You would expect that with an organisation that's spending a couple of hundred million quid. That couple hundred million quid included the field hospital, which wasn't ours. We gave it over to someone else, so you wouldn't expect that to be our asset. Um, current assets up a little bit. You will note that cash went up. Short term debtors, because we were owed money back from the Welsh Government, went up. Um, in terms of short term liabilities, equally went up about as much as current assets. So in one sense, that side of the balance sheet is pretty darn boring, given the overall activity of a couple of hundred million pounds worth of spend and assets added to. <clears throat> And if you look at net assets, overall, hardly moved. For a one and a half, two billion pound organisation, hardly moved. In terms of the reserves themselves, general fund, at outturn, I topped it up a little bit from 9.3 to 10 million. The HRA balances went up. Capital receipts hardly moved. Yes, we added to the capital grants on applied account, which is a usable reserve and is often added to the 50 million pounds on general funds. So you'll see several references in the document to 55 million pounds worth of reserves. And <clears throat> um, and then where we put the 50 million pounds with the general generally marked reserves, the 50 million pound general fund going from 80 to 134 84 to 134, the 50 million. Again, you've got that consistency of read across and a very substantial increase in usable reserves. You then have a raft of items called the unusable reserves, and I will touch on this again in due course. This is normally the boring part of the balance sheet, but because of the auditor's comments will be a matter of some discussion and debate, I am sure. Um, it's an interesting one. These are weird accounting conventions to make local authority accounts look like normal accounts. Um, the, uh, there is a tension between local government legislation and proper accounting practice. My professional institute has a device that ensures that the two are squared away. Um, they are utterly untouchable and unusable. Those of you that know me and I refer to the earmarked reserves as the jam jars and with my permission, I give you permission to consider as you're the deciding body as a, as a council and cabinet, what to spend the jam jar money on. These are the metaphorical equivalent of jam jars with padlocks under a mountain in outer space. You cannot touch them. They are important professionally but there is nothing you can do about them. And they are odd entries, and we will focus later on the debate between the revaluation reserve and the capital adjustment account. And you will note the other large one, which is a negative reserve. It often is for all authorities. It's the future pension liabilities. And although it's a scarily big minus number, it reflects the fact that we've got a funding contribution of about the next 20 years to make good pension fund deficits. Again, entirely normal like most other authorities. You expect that one to be minus for most authorities. You expect these two technical reserves to be large. And much of the debate that we're going to have from our auditors is the split between that combined billion pounds, which helps support all of the entries for the fixed assets above. Sounds a bit obscure and technical. And in a normal year, I'll just skip past it and say nothing to see here. But there are matters that you will need to see here on this occasion. Uh, apologies if I'm over laboring the point, but I wanted to uh, pick up on some of the uh, important bits. I'm going to jump down to page 31 now. 31 and 32 are the um, group balance sheets. So again, we've got a number of consolidated entities that go into that, um, <clears throat> which means that they, uh, they, they vary ever so slightly. Skip into page 35, the cash flow statement. Important for summarising the um, lifeblood of the organisation. All of last year was about surviving through COVID, where we were spending money we didn't have until we got it back from Welsh Government. Um, and as you'll see, some important ones there. Look at the, just the sheer scale of the difference from 1920 to 2021. Surplus on the provision of services up 70 plus million. Lots of technical adjustments through the, the cash flow statement as well explaining the capital financing activities, um, running through a whole raft of technical entries, and you'll see at the end there, cash and cash equivalents, 
went up in the year. We ended the year more cash rich than we started the year. Um, and that's important for assuring you on the overall uh, lifeblood of the organization. And then in similar vein, the group cash flow, which consolidates in other entities. I'm going to jump now to page 70. And I can't scroll quite fast enough. Right, page 70, expenditure and income analysis. This is a, a useful one in terms of the segmental reporting of activity by spend and income type. You will see employee costs were up modestly. You will see that transport costs shock horror reduced as most of us were working from home or services were otherwise not running to full capacity in terms of public transport and other activities. Shock horror, we spent a little bit less on supplies and services. Other costs rocketed. And then when you go down to the income, you will see instances of our service income dried up. We had income losses, which we were partly recompensed by Welsh Government. Um, our council tax income held up relatively well, but there are losses on that, which I'll draw your attention to in due course. But still, we got more in than last year. And then you've got the rocketing of government grants and contributions. This was partly as agent to provide money to businesses, to individuals, but also, as I say, to recompense us for some of the COVID costs and some of the income losses. So again, you would expect with the messaging I gave all year to see some wild swings there, rather more wild swings than you would have in, in a normal year. <clears throat> I'm going to jump to page 75. And I think this is probably the most important bit that, again, I want to emphasize. I've already referenced it a couple of times. This, you'll be pleased to know, is the first time you've got a reserves uh, statement that's in portrait mode and won't strain your, your necks. It shows the overall position on a raft of reserves and transfers in year and uh, the movements there on. So you can see a whole raft of route movements. Schools reserves trebled. Mostly that's temporal. It's temporary because there was a lot of money that schools were given at year end. But those of you that are long serving will know that that absolute figure at 7.7 .7 million was the largest in Wales. Absolutely trebled. You can see that we massively increased our ICT reserve. That's again to provide for the future costs of schools infrastructure. We're being very prudent and setting aside the money 10 years up front. You will see that. Um, the uh, contingency fund was topped up to 10 million pounds because we've still got COVID uncertainty in the, in the current year. Cabinet approved a recovery reserve, a recovery fund reserve of 20 million. So you would expect to see that there. We topped up a raft of other reserves and ultimately you see the massive increase in reserves from 84 million, which you'll recognise if you cast back to the balance sheet, up to 134 million. So there's the 50 million pound plus on those revenue general fund reserves the movement on the HRA reserve as well. So the message you'll get, which is consistent with the resilience report, is very, very substantial increases in reserves. I'm going to jump now to page 81 in terms of the edited highlights. And um, page 81 is important because the statement of accounts is not only about the backward look for the year, it's also important to the reader of the accounts that they understand some of the commitments we entered into. So that's a relatively long large list of value. But again, um, <clears throat> those of you that have seen me present to Cabinet and at Outturn know that we undertook substantial borrowing to address the, uh, the the substantial capital aspirations and agreed plan, which I had a £200 million capital borrowing envelope in total agreed through the budget over a number of years. And I've continued to borrow some of those money at, at historically low rates. Um, and it helps finance a raft of these items. And again, you'll see that the single biggest bit still committed to at year end um, was the finalising of the Swansea Central Phase 1. It's important that you understand the context of how much is uh, yet to be expended. They're not material given the uh, uh, size of the authority's activity and the amount of borrowing I've already done to fund it. I'm now going to jump to page 98, 99 and 100. And these are the unusable reserves. And as I say, I would ordinarily not make much of an issue on this, but I feel duty bound to draw your attention to some of the matters. 
the pension reserve whilst a scary big number is pretty much like every other authority so i'm not proposing to particularly draw your attention to that one it's a very obscure technical reserve which um uh, normally has a minus balance on it um an interesting one is the accumulated absences account another technical one just as a point of note um when members acknowledge the hard work of officers across the authority many officers have worked on and on and on and not taken any leave and so this is a measure of how much leave that people have accrued and earned but haven't yet taken it's not remunerated in cash because it's part of the overall salary but again it's a highly unusual jump previous year it went up about 700 grand it went up 50 percent that's indicative of the goodwill that staff have given in terms of not taking leave to ensure that services are run so you can see some of these obscure technical entries whilst the for a sort of a quick read mean nothing actually do play out in the real world effects and the contributions that all staff have made in terms of working through the pandemic so i thought i'd draw attention to that one even though it's a, a slightly unusual one i'm going to draw your attention now to page um draw attention to the bottom of page 98 yeah so that's the reserves figure uh, I'm going to drill down to page, I've done 101 in terms of negative reserves figure, apologies, I've lost my, my train of thought. I'm going to jump to page 111 next, if I may. Um, <clears throat> This summarises the number of employees by remuneration band. Um, it has gone up a little bit in 1920 in 2021, um, despite 10 years of um, relatively low pay awards. 2021 had a relatively high pay award and um, it probably has affected this somewhat where you see remuneration bands. So if someone was on £64,999, we don't have that many of them, but many of them are head teachers. If they go up a pound, they jump to the next band. So you can see that the number in the lowest band has gone down, the next band has gone up, etc. There may be some press interest in that because normally they look at things and it has gone up more than normal. But after years of noughts and one percent, there was a 2.75 percent pay increase for local government staff and 3.75 percent for teachers. But that, as I say, is an unusual year in a, a period of 10 years. So I don't think you'll see the same level of jump up in, in, in future years but one that you will probably see some press reporting on. Uh, in normal years, the press normally <clears throat> uh, focus on the exit package costs. And those of you that are long serving remember when, when, when in extreme austere times, it was five, six million pounds a year. It's come down and come down and come down. 19, 20, a couple of million pounds. Very little churn in the current year and it's down to a relatively modest million pounds. I say relatively modest because departures are only allowed if they pay back within three years. And so, again, I think this year the press probably won't pick up on that because it's a non story for them. And so they may focus on that previous one around who got what in terms of pay, uh, pay bans. I'm going to jump now to page 113. And this, again, is one where you see the real world effects of COVID. The grant income account um, <clears throat> uh, note, you, you look through it and the list just gets longer and longer. A whole raft of noughts in 1920. Nought, nought, as I'm pointing on the screen, nought, 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 nought. Entries galore on the other side, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, it barely fits on the pages, but you see again the real world effects of significant grants flowing through, and these last ones in particular, a whole raft of grants that have flowed into the authority as a result of us. <clears throat> repurposing and providing COVID assistance to a whole raft of organisations and individuals. Uh, I'm going to jump now to page 120 because I'm sure there'll be some members that are interested in that. There's been much debate over the years and discussion uh, around the city deal. <clears throat> uh, this authority, um, in, in terms of its Swansea Central Phase 1, put plenty of cash up front and built faster than others. <clears throat> Um, the city deal has been a bit of a long burner in terms of money coming through in terms of the grants, but I'm pleased to draw your attention to three years worth of money's come in one go. So we've had over £11 million pounds worth of city deal grant funding. And of course, in the budget, the Chancellor did announce there was going to be a further acceleration of city deal grant funding. So whilst we won't get the same immediate um, hit in one year, we should see some accelerated funding uh, in future years as well, which helps 
rebalance the costs where undoubtedly the council has done the original heavy lifting. I'm going to jump now and get towards the end. You'll be pleased to know page 122. And I've gone way too far. Because again, I'm using the. Uh, by the 122 to 125, which again, apologies, this is on a this is on a sort of landscape, but you see these are all these are all the ones that marked up COVID, 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 COVID. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Um, again, just showing the sheer amount of things we did with COVID labels on them. You wouldn't have any of these in a normal year in the accounts. It's what I call the COVID specials. And then you've got three pages of narrative here on what they all were, what we gave out in terms of business grants, carers, statutory sick pay grant, whole raft of things that never existed a year before. We've had to do all of that in our spare time as financial officers and my non-financial colleagues, and we've done it all with a relative aplomb. So I'm incredibly proud of what the, 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 the troops have achieved. Um, I'm going to jump now to page 133 next. Page 133 onwards. Uh, I think probably page 134 onwards. I've gone slightly wrong on what I'm talking about there. So you can ignore that note that I was going to talk about. Here it is. I found it now. It's uh, page 135. Apologies. Contingent liabilities. At the point at which we do the accounts, there are a whole raft of things that are unknown. Uh, they include the normal things. Now, we have some interesting debates with our auditors because some of them they feel are a bit generic because I'm supposed to, if I can, try and estimate the potential effect. And many of them are very difficult to, to, to know. But the normal sort of disclosures are in there, as you'd expect. Um, and then going down, you get more um, and more. And then no surprise, there's a COVID special again there at uh, <clears throat> the end of it um, in terms of who knows what's going to happen. I'm going to jump now to page 140, which is an important one, summarising the proceeds from council tax and the important bit, which I fully reported at Outturn. We made a £600,000 loss in 1920, despite getting more council tax in. The, we didn't get as much as we hoped and we posted a £2.5 million loss on council tax and many authorities will be vexed about that. Um, as the economic support in the wider economy unwinds, People's ability to meet council tax will be challenging. Uh, I've got a legal duty to collect it all to um, because otherwise it falls on other council taxpayers. But you can see there are some concerns there, not unlike other authorities. For 2021, we did get a grant to recompense us for most of that from the Welsh Government. Um, there is no certainty of recompense in due course. I'm going to now jump to page 147, really on the home leg now, because you will be bored of me talking. Page 147, I'm going to be very cursory on these. Um, <clears throat> and that is to just bring in the notion that, of course, in the set of accounts, we also have a housing revenue account. We're one of 11 authorities that's got an HRA uh, and the HRA had a tidy year again. And in, in terms of posting a surplus, adding to reserves. And again, you can see some of the impact because we focused on essential repairs. There was a bit less spend on other repairs and maintenance. Um, Dwelling rents actually held up remarkably well, which is a, a, a credit to the housing officers and uh, recovery processes, because often the committee is worried about how we do in terms of collecting rents. Um, and you see the overall position in terms of um, the usual operation of a surplus on HRA operational services, which is then heavily ploughed into capital financing, which results in a, a, for a slight increase in the HRA reserves and overall increase in the reserve balances. Um, the rest of the report, page 151 to 191, is the annual governance statement, which I'm not going to take you through because you've received the draft of that previously at this committee and questioned me and other officers at length. And then you have right at the end a glossary. So you will be pleased to know that is the end of my dulcet tones on what is a long canter through. And I do appreciate it is difficult, but I couldn't think of a better way to try and give you a flavour of the individual items and drawing your attention to particularly the COVID related distortions. And as I've said, I may come back in once the auditors have drawn their attention to that uh, technical matter between the two unusable reserves. So I'm going to unshare my screen and hand back to you, Chair, with your permission. Thank you, Ben. I love that was long. It's very informative, and I think you've, you've quite correctly highlighted all the 
the, the, the variances to what would normally be in, in a set of accounts because of the COVID situation. Um, do we have any questions, please, for Ben? Or any comments? Any hands up? Julie, Julie Davis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to recognise all of the uh, the work that's gone into preparing these accounts because I'm I'm well aware of of how much does go into it, both in terms of the the preparation and the audit of it. Uh, my my two questions aren't in um, material in terms of the the overall accounts, Ben, but I was wondering because of your comments on the uh, the the debtors situation with council tax. Um, was it prudent to to change the the bad debt provision downwards based on the um, historic last three years because 2021 was quite exceptional? I was wondering what rationale you used for for reducing the bad debt provision. We were asked by our auditors to consider it because we had a very long standing arrangement which was for bad debts. Um, and it is done on a mechanical basis. And yes, surprisingly, in one sense, it resulted in a reduction in the historic arrears. Um, there's an interplay because council tax is an unusual thing and, it, and Wales is different again to England. So we have to recognise all the losses in year on the account. Um, England have three years to recover the losses and part of as, as a COVID exemption, uh, what normally happens is it's the, the future the future sort of downturn is taken into account in tax settings. So, the, so here you see in the historic bit, it looks a little bit odd in one sense, oh, you're reducing the bad debt provision, but that's a mechanical squirt out as a result of a, 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 a rerunning of assumptions. But I did increase the assumed rate of loss on collection when advising council to set the level of council tax because we we work out the 100% tax base and then we make allowance for what we're not likely to collect. And I did increase the amount there for future non-collection. So we've got two bites of the cherry, Julie, effectively. If you didn't have that second bit, I think you would have been right. To, well, you were right to raise it anyway in terms of questioning me on those matters that are of interest but I think you've got a compensating entry there I've assumed I'm going to be collecting less going forward in the future years because of course the 2021 accounts only had seven days worth of Covid effect in them effectively it's net you know it's um uh, sorry I'm, I'm yeah I'm talking slightly out of kilter there but, you know in terms of many people have been able to pay for last year because you had furlough and you had the support going on it's this year where all of that wider economic support unwinds that probably the risks are greater and as I say to some extent I've neutralized that uh, to some extent by reducing the amount of assumed collection that in itself is a difficult one because members decide on my advice but if we assume we're collecting less to start with I'm assuming I'm a I've got to add a, effectively a little premium on everyone else's council tax in the first place if I'm only assuming I'm getting 95p in the pound I'm charging everyone else nearly 105p in the pound if you get what I mean it doesn't quite work with that you know what it's like with VAT and proportional bits but uh, that's that's the sort of the, the short answer as to why I'm relaxed with it and the auditors have reviewed our calculations and are happy with our bad debt provision calculations. Thank you. Thank you. And could, sorry, could I have a second question? You draw drew our attention to the accumulated absence provision, um, which is higher than, than last year. There's a risk of staff burnout if they're unable to take their uh, um, annual leave. And there is a risk to service delivery if they do take their annual leave. So has this been recognised as a risk for the council and are there any mitigations in place to re reduce the to acceptable levels the risk? The risk is real and um, it is recognised by corporate management team. Uh, there is a workforce strategy which is being worked through which you've asked to see in due course and that real risk of burnout it is, is of great concern. Corporate management team has agreed additional resources to provide additional pastoral and consultancy report support to staff um, but um, it's not directly related to the accounts, but I just wanted to highlight that one as a particular example, because I know from personal experience with many of my dedicated staff, they've taken literally no leave and there are risks, but that is the real world effects of, of COVID. But I can assure you that uh, the workforce strategy is being worked on, uh, occupational health support is being bolstered, but it is an enormous ask and it is an enormous ask of all, all staff. You know, it's 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 not unique to local government. It's there in a whole raft of uh, areas at the moment. And even a large authority like ours in a number of areas, we only have one or two specialists in each area. So it is a very real risk and concern, Julie, and you're right to, uh, to, to flag that. It's one of those real world effects of what is otherwise a bland entry in a statement of accounts. Thank you, Ben. 
Uh, just to add to that, uh, the audit committee has been well aware of the risks around the workforce strategy or the absence of a strategy uh, for some time now, and I've had assurance from the chief exec um, that this will be given some pace as, as um, will be completed hopefully by the end of this year. Um, Councillor Jeff Jones. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I think if uh, nobody, if somebody had, hadn't appreciated the work that the staff had actually done before, I think the uh, the figures you've actually highlighted with regards to people not taking leave, as you know, really uh, put it at the forefront. Anyway, you know, with regards to you know, it's good news you mentioned about the the city deal that we've had three years worth of well back pay as such, you know, which is, which is good news. And hopefully it'll go down to the uh, the 10 year cycle and not the 15 year cycle for the funding from Welsh Government and Westminster Government. Um, but I, I'm actually looking at the short term, I'm looking on page, sorry. Second. Page 17. Um, it actually highlights revenue shortfalls, um, which are going to increase, you know, as time goes on. I know we got the MRP, but that's going to have a tipping point and so on. Um, we're actually mentioning in there that there's going to be a 5% uh, increase in council tax as well. I think that's a, that's a given and so on. Um, I'm worried about the longer term. We've got a buffet as such with regards to, you know, this money from the city deal and, uh, you know, marvellous funding really from Welsh Government this year, which I don't think is going to happen again, to be uh, to be truthful. Um, are we storing up problems? You know, we are actually in a, shall we say, um, a reasonable position now, but as time actually goes on with all these and additional borrowings, borrowings that are actually coming on line, um, I'm a little bit worried or very worried actually with regards to the, the longer term. Are we going to be able to afford to actually function at the end of the day? Perhaps if I could come back in chair and I think that the leader has also indicated he wishes to speak. I mean, in terms of the statement of accounts, it's, a, it's obviously a matter of technical record. Council agreed a medium term financial plan which made assumptions over a 5% council tax increase. There is no guarantee that that is what it is going to be. So the statement of accounts merely records what decisions have been made as planning assumptions. The point you make is a valid one, Councillor Jones. The reality is still the very, very vast majority of our income in Wales, in all local authorities, comes from block and specific grant. 25% only from council tax. The non-domestic rates um, yield is under enormous strain and Welsh Government itself has made quite clear a number of times that you know it has limited revenue raising powers of its own and is hugely dependent on the Treasury. Treasury assumptions at the moment are that Covid has gone away and there are no financial impacts after this year. That was the assumption last time the budget was announced. If there is no money in the system then yes we will be worried but I think everyone will be worried. You know, we can't speculate about those items in the statement of accounts, but I use the statement of accounts to draw attention to what are risks. If grant don't turn up, we will have pressures. But equally, as you will see in the resilience report that the auditors are going to comment on, and as you rightly contextualise, Councillor Jones, we have a, a decent buffer. I'd rather have the £50 million in the bank and the firepower in the war chest. But yes, if, if times get tough, it will be tough for us as it will be for everyone else, but I think we've improved our relative position when you see the outcomes for all 22 authorities. Um, and uh, it's the normal risks that are put in there. I mean, you know, um, it, it could be something else that will undo an individual authority in due course. No one in previous years had put in anything about COVID, did they? And you see the chaos that's caused in hundreds of millions. As long as people step up to the plate and there's money in the system, it's not a problem. I think that's probably all I need to say on it. I do. I'm aware, Chair, the leader did indicate he wished also to comment on it because I think there are probably some wider matters that he need, he would wish to comment on that, if, if with your permission. Yeah, do you want to comment, leader? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I just wanted to clarify. I have had uh, the letter from uh, the uh, Secretary of State uh, confirming the accelerated funding from. Uh, UK government over the 10 year period. So that is confirmed and I'm sure the letter can be shared with the committee if you, if you so wish. Um, in terms of Welsh government, they'd already announced, of course, an accelerated funding uh, um, schedule for the city deal. But again, we're in discussions about how that perhaps could be improved further. 
Um, in addition to that, as Mr Smith has said, you know, this is um, about the fact that we've been able to bolster the accounts this year. But of course, that was on top of the allocations that we'd made into the capital equalisation reserve in previous years. So, you know, as Mr Smith uh, has previously reported, you know, we have set aside um, repayments on the major schemes, which also include, obviously, uh, the money that we need to find to build our new schools estate. Uh, and again, you know, if you know, committee should remember that the bigger part of what we do uh, in terms of building capital program is actually in our schools estate. That's where we spend even more money um, uh, in terms of improving the infrastructure for the authority. I guess, you know, when it comes down to it, Mr Smith would never let any politician do things that were unaffordable or were reckless. You know, these things are, are all done in the basis of uh, acknowledging and assessing the risks that are before us. And then it comes down to will, doesn't it? You know, in terms of whether you're prepared to invest to create the wealth, whether you are prepared to invest along with both governments to create the jobs and the opportunities that the city needs. Um, I certainly, you know, wouldn't uh, adopt the position uh, or wouldn't have adopted the position whereby, you know, we would have not been delivering any of this because you could imagine the the really scary future that Swansea would be now facing as an authority if we didn't have the momentum and the major investment going in both in our schools to support future uh, people going into the workforce, uh, but also the jobs uh, and the opportunities that will now exist in our rebuilt city centre, which continues to attract investment. So, you know, all of those things are really important and it's important that we as a council are a catalyst for that and a, and a leading partner in delivering that. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just contextualising the risk. There will always be risks and there will always be many reasons why you won't do something, but you always have to look at the, the reasons for doing stuff. And that's that's what we've tried to do as an administration is to make sure that we we deliver on those promises and deliver on the, the economy that the, the region really needs. Thank you, Rob. Um, I've got a number of hands up now, so can we go to uh, Councillor Rayner? Thank you. Um, a couple of points. One, can I just echo what the, the leader has said? The cost of the city centre development almost pales into insignificance when you look at the long standing development we've had in the capital building in the education sector for our new schools, colleges and universities. Uh, and the actual building has been a huge multiplier across a whole range of occupations. And I think we should be really pleased with the work we've done there. Going back to the accounts, can I again thank Mr Smith for his very lucid voyage through quite a long document. And also commend him and his department and other council workers who have during the COVID period done an outstanding job Although much of the money coming in has been from the Welsh Government to support COVID initiatives, it is not simply uh, an act of just transferring money from one fund to other people. For instance, for setting up the free school meals distribution of funding, we had an enormous task to get out to over 8,000, rising to 9,000 people, a system for actually paying them. We had to ensure people had access to uh, digital equipment, to have email accounts, and it's quite wrong to assume everyone has email accounts, before we could even start processing the payments. We've also had to run alongside the direct payment to banks the food box scheme for those families who opted for that. And I'd like to pay tribute especially to Kelly Small, who worked with the Home Office so that we could pay directly into the Home Office Aspen card for those people, for those asylum seekers eligible for free school meals. So we have not been just transferring money from one system into another. We have actually been working with our residents to ensure there are mechanisms for paying and paying out to everyone who is eligible. Now, my question is on school reserves. Those of us who are school governors 
would have been, shall we say, completely gobsmacked at the sums that have been suddenly appearing in our school accounts. Many of those grants cover one, two and three years, especially those for well-being and mental health, and also for the training of staff towards the development of the new curriculum and the introduction of the additional learning needs bill through the school system. Now, for the new curriculum and adult learning, there have been recent announcements um, moving start dates slightly. Now, my question to Mr Smith is what support are we putting into schools? And we are essentially amateurs as governing bodies. I know our head teachers get some training in financial management, but we are faced now with managing funds over a longer period of time and ensuring that those grants are spent for the purposes for which they were issued. And I know many school governing bodies would seek further advice and would expect more support, somewhat more than the usual sit down of the, peer, the, the support officer with the head teacher and the chair of governors, because we have a lot of money that has to be spent, but it has to be spent on the right things in the right time scale. Thank you. Ben, do you want to respond? Uh, yes, briefly, and, and, and Councillor Rayner is right to draw attention to the, the contextual nature of the substantial increase and the very late nature of the items and that they are a relatively long burn in terms of spend. And she rightly acknowledges the role of the PSOs and some of my accountancy staff, but equally they are limited in numbers. I think um, there, are, there is opportunity for us to give additional support in conjunction with Kelly's team and my own in terms of giving specific advice to individual schools. Some head teachers have asked me for individual advice um, and I'm prepared to give that to, to, to give assistance, um, but it is going to be done in, in, in tandem. Um, schools have indicated a very substantial part will be spent in the first and second year and we will continue to endeavour to give them all support that we can and provide all support across the council including the wider procurement advice and other matters because as councillor rayner quite rightly says for individual head teachers um whilst it's part of the expectation of their skill set that's not the primary function or focus and it's really scary when you're stuck with millions to deal with and for some schools it will mean very substantial capital expenditure and we are trying to make available um, all support we can whilst recognising that we've not taken on any more staff to provide that support. Um, I think that's probably the best answer I can give at the moment, Councillor Rayner, but I think it's a, a, a valid point to raise that schools and head teachers and governing bodies will need assistance on it. And the most important thing is the context. I would still, I go back to what I said with our own reserves as an authority, I'd rather start with an extra £50 million in the bank, I'd rather have the extra £20 million. I'd rather have the travelling in schools, but there is an art to the telling of the tale and an even greater art in the detail of how it is appropriately spent to ensure maximum value for money and achieving the right outcomes and spent on the right things. The worst thing with one-off grants is if they ever end up getting used for base provision because when they unwind, and COVID related ones will, but we've seen it with a whole raft of other items. It's a minister's gift to have favoured projects and specific grants, and it's not just unique to education, but when they unwind, it can be very difficult. And that's probably the most important part. And I think that's probably what Councillor Rayner is alluding to. Um, and we see that in other areas too, where um, if it starts to substitute for core provision, it then becomes very dangerous later on if it dries up because it's difficult to bridge that gap. That's probably all I'd want to say, Chair. I can see the leader has indicated he also wishes to comment on this matter. Yeah, I've spotted. Leader, do you want to comment? Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to make uh, a point, I know uh, Councillor Rayner from her previous role would have been concerned about this. It's, it's striking that balance between ensuring that schools hold sufficient reserves but not excessive reserves. And, you know, we, we have worked with schools for a number of years now to make sure that they do reduce their reserves to a reasonable level. I do feel sympathy for schools, though, in, in this respect, in that a lot of money arrived, as Mr Smith said, late in the year, which, which for accounting purposes has, has made their reserves look incredibly large. But, you know, we want the reserves and the money that schools hold to reach the children and to reach the, the items for which they were provided and to do so in a sensible and manageable way. And we will support them to do it. But we don't want a yard sale either. That's the last thing we would want, you know, is, is uncontrolled spend on things that are not appropriate. So it's striking that balance and that's what we will continue to do. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I've still got some hands then, so thank you for your patience, those who are waiting to, to question. Um, can I go to Councillor Peter Black first, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just on page 81, 81 I think it is, um, the notes the, on the capital commitments. I, um, I know Ben referred to this in his presentation, um, and we're looking at capital commitments of around, was it £69 million pounds next year? Um, uh, I think as well, on top of the 99 million pounds, which we've just come out, 65 million on top of the 99 million we've come out of. I'm just wondering in terms of the impact on the revenue on revenue um, for the next few years, um, is this is, is this going to have a quite a significant impact on revenue or are we going to be relying on the capital equalisation fund to offset the, the cost of, of these particular um, borrowing? Borrowings? Again, if I may come in, Chair, it is a mixture of both. Um, you, <clears throat> Again, this is a, a factual report of commitments entered into at the end of the year. By way of context, I've already reported to Cabinet, I had a, I had a 180 million, which came a 200 million pound borrowing envelope approved as part of the Treasury Management Strategy and as part of successive MTFPs. Members will be aware that I borrowed 90 million pounds a couple of years ago. Um, in terms of the, the, the tranche and all of the MTFP assumptions were based on the stepped increases and including banking the MRP saving and including using the, the capital equalisation reserve to smooth the transition. Um, I can report that I have in the current year already borrowed £75 million. So again, you see that quantum, the £69 million commitment. I took out another £45 million and a further £30 million worth of borrowing. It's all within that planned trajectory. It's affordable within the revenue budget plans and medium term financial plans. But as all members are aware, when I gave advice on the overall capital strategy, it did require relative choices to be made between capital and revenue. So the short answer is it's affordable within the future envelope agreed and the amount that was committed to has already been financed by borrowing at historically low rates but there will be some trade-offs you know there were alternative choices to be made years ago but council set out its plan its capital ambition agreed the mtfp and everything is consistent and in line with that at this point in time so it will be managed by a mixture of borrowing at the right time to bring some of the borrowing until the best possible time, trying to get those rates locked in at the best rate, uh, banking the MRP saving, but also using that capital equalisation reserve, which was only meant to be temporary and smooth the glide path. I think I previously referred in council to it, anticipating it lasting till 25, 26. As I indicated in budget setting with the Chancellor's announcement of this stretch of uh, the acceleration of UK government city deal fund, which we're still waiting the detail on, my gut feel is it may stretch to 28, 29, but it's all designed to be that escalator effect rather than the elevator effect of having to suddenly meet the cost in the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Lita, did you want to comment? Sorry, Chair, it was a it was a legacy hand, but I, the point I would have made was the one Mr. Smith did, which is actually, you know, the the capital equalisation reserve now potentially provides us with even more uh, comfort in terms of having a longer period at which it can offset any additional costs of borrowing. Thank you, um, Councillor Hennigan. Yes, um, regarding borrowing, I could take you back many years when uh, a lot of money was going to be borrowed. But I, I don't think I'm here today to uh, score political points. So I'll, I'll go to the question of, um, I, it was a lot of reading, and I was trying to see how much was spent on consultation, participation, community involvement, that side of things. Um, I went through quite a lot of pay. I couldn't see it. If you can guide me to that, I'd be happy. If not, I'll go back to the paperwork and try again. Uh, you, you haven't missed it, Councillor Hennigan. The, the code of practice in terms of what needs to be disclosed in the statement of accounts is fairly prescriptive about what should be um, disclosed. That sort of level of segmental detailed reporting isn't required in the code, so it wouldn't be reported in the statement of accounts. Um, it is a matter that if you are interested upon it, it can be referred to in the outturn reports in future years or can be picked up as councillor questions, but you haven't missed it. It's not hidden in there anywhere. It's just something that isn't asked for for us to be reporting on the amount we've spent on consultation and participation. I mean, it's an interesting question because obviously the changes to the local government bill and some of the future stuff does really ramp up those obligations. Obligations we always I'm had to be a good authority. Tennessee agreements now, for God's sake. <laughs> no. <coughs> I don't know what about that. I'm not seeing any other hands, um, in which case we can bring this agenda right into the, to a close. It, it's for noting and forwarding to the council. 
So Peter's hand. Is Peter Peter's here? Have you still got a question? I thank you very too. Thank you very much. Councillor Black, is your hand from a legacy? I'm assuming it's um, it's a legacy hand then. Okay, then if we can bring that matter to a close and move on to um, Audit Wales I said 260 report. And can I welcome Jason Garcia? And perhaps you'd like to take us through this report, Jason. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you should have in front of you now your audit of accounts report uh, as a draft report. The final one of this report will go to council uh, next week, which will then uh, approve uh, the financial statements. I will give some verbal updates on things that have gone on since uh, you know this report was drafted. So if I can just take you to the first page, then the contents page, as uh, has already been alluded to, the overall heading, unfortunately, for this report this year is that we intend to issue a qualified audit report on your accounts and I will go into the detail of that and try and explain some of the context as we go through the report and there are some other issues to report you prior to the accounts approval. If I can then take you over the page to paragraph uh, four next, as I think I've explained previously, whenever we do any audit we set a context of materiality, which is the level of error we're prepared to accept in an issue in our audit opinion. That's based generally on the level of expenditure in a set of accounts for a particular period. So for Swansea Council for this particular year, we set that level at 9.3 million. And just going back to our overall heading about the qualified audit opinion, Basically, what we're saying, and I'll come on to the specific wording for that, is that we aren't comfortable in one particular area that we haven't got an error, error of greater than that value of 9.3 million, but we'll come on to that in a little while. So paragraph five talks about a couple of areas where we uh, apply a different materiality level. So you can see there are two areas, senior officers remuneration and related parties for members and senior officers where basically uh, in totality for senior officer remuneration, we wouldn't look at it normally based on materiality of 9.3 million, but obviously it's a lot of political sensitivity as to you know how uh, those disclosures are made. And as such, we work to a much lower level of materiality to ensure that there's uh, a higher degree of accuracy in relation to those disclosures. If I can then take you on to paragraph seven, uh, this is, was where we were when we drafted this uh, report as a number of areas that were outstanding. Uh, I will be updating this paragraph going forward for the Council because some of these now items have actually uh, been resolved. Uh, so where we are currently is the first bullet point has now been complete and there's nothing further I need to bring to your attention that's not already included in uh, the report that you have today, so that won't be included in the document that goes to Council. Uh, the final review of the audit file still needs to be undertaken, so that will be included in the report that goes next week to Council. Our final review of the revised 2021 financial statements has been done and the statements that you have in front of you today and that Ben has gone through with you uh, is the one we're happy with and the one that we will be looking to issue an audit opinion on. Uh, we have now reviewed the response from management and those charged with governments in relation to the inquiries in relation to fraud laws and regulations and related party transactions. So again, that will come out. The last bullet point is still to be done. Um, I'll come on to it in a little while to explain uh, why it needs to be done this year, but that is one that will still remain uh, in the report that goes to council next week. If I can then take you forward to paragraph nine, uh, this is uh, where we have um, pieces of correspondence from potentially electors who have rights in relation to the statement of accounts. Uh, we have had uh, some items of correspondence uh, so far, which we have responded to. The, the, this um, is open to members of the public to continue to bring things to our attention until such time as the audit is signed off. So basically, there is the potential that items could be brought to our attention over the next few days, next week, you know, that ultimately would result in our uh, potentially not being able to issue the audit opinion that we were going to issue or are going to issue as planned. 
the time scale we're working to at the moment is obviously you're receiving this report today. Uh, we will update this report based on what I've just gone through. That will then go to council uh, on the 2nd of September with the aim of that, that meeting that the council will approve the financial statements. And we're currently booked in to meet the Auditor General for Wales uh, to have the audit opinion issued on the 7th of September. If we receive no items of a correspondence between now and the 7th of September, that audit opinion will be issued as planned. Obviously, if we do, I will update Council next week verbally and obviously we'll have discussions you know, with uh, Ben and his team in relation to any items of correspondence that do are received over the next few days if that does happen. So I just wanted to highlight the potential you know, for that to, to delay the issue of signing off. The next section of the report uh, talks about the impact of COVID-19 on this year's audit. You know, we've all been working very differently over the last year or so. And certainly I'd like to thank Ben you know, and his officers for continuing to you know, work and flexibly with us. You know, and it has been challenging for us all, you know, and ultimately, you know, we have had to adapt to new ways of working. So, you know, I'd certainly like to echo that as part of my report today. Um, in the past, we would have had all sort of uh, signatures manually done. You know, we've moved away from that now. We now accept electronic signatures. We would be issuing our audit opinion or with an electronic signature from the Auditor General. So, you know, that's just outlining the different ways of working there. And there's a section then on audit evidence, which shows how we have been working differently and how we've been obtaining information that historically we'd have done in certain ways that we now have to do remotely. Uh, so if I can now take you on to the section for the proposed audit opinion. Uh, the, as I said, we are going to be issuing a qualified audit opinion on this year's set of accounts. Once we get your letter of representation, which a template for that document is based in Appendix 1 to this report. Ben has already alluded to the fact that this is a very technical accounting uh, qualification relating to how uh, two unusable reserves, being the revaluation reserve and capital adjustment account, how those have historically been accounted for. And ultimately, the paragraph 16 talks about the scale of those two reserves being 369 million and 712 million, respectively. So ultimately, uh, it is a historic issue. Uh, that um, the revaluation reserve came into being um, back in 2007. And basically, there's uh, technical accounting requirements as to how transactions hit the different reserves at different times. You know, we're certainly satisfied that the total between the two reserves is correct. Uh, but we are uh, of the view that the split is materially incorrect. Now, this uh, has been discussed, obviously, through the audit pro process, you know, with Ben and his team. And uh, to be fair to the uh, finance department, they tried to come up with a, a, a in the limited amount of time we had an estimate, you know, for the potential error. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to come to a conclusion that that give us the assurance we wanted over the split. And ultimately, there's a there is a significant amount of uh, tracing back uh, to individual revaluations that needs to be done to actually work out the specific error that uh, is in the split between these two reserves. I think I'd very much want to you know, highlight what I say in paragraph 21 in bold there, you know, unusable reserves are not resource backed, as Ben said, he, he spent a long time going through, you know, the, your uh, year mark reserves and what the council has set those aside for. These are very much accounting entries, you know, based on specific circumstances, you know, and those reserves cannot be used for any other purpose. And again, I'd like to highlight the uh, in bold in paragraph uh, 22, where ultimately we say in it is purely the split between the two reserves that is the issue and that the overall unusable reserves balance is correct uh, as uh, as it is currently. So we then in paragraph 23 talk about, you know, that uh, the council will need now to look at their accounting records to try and quantify the level of potential error. Uh, going forward, and we'll sit. We, you know, we're planning on sitting down with uh, Jeff Dong and his team in September now to start work, working through what is needed to come up with uh, a proposal as to how that is resolved going forward. 
So our actual wording of our audit report will I'll come on to is in Appendix 2. If I can then take you to paragraph 25, uh, there is another slight amendment to our audit opinion. This is uh, in relation to an inclusion of something called an emphasis of matter paragraph. Uh, this is something we have included in uh, a number of sets of public bodies accounts over the last couple of years, and is purely aiming to draw the attention of the reader of the accounts to two particular notes in the accounts, being note 14 and note 16 of the accounts. In those notes, your valuer has highlighted that due to the impact of COVID-19 on uh, the valuations of surplus city centre assets and investment property assets, they've included what's called a material valuation uncertainty clause. And our emphasis on matter paragraph is just drawing the reader's attention to that particular uncertainty clause. Uh, but it's not in any way a qualification, so it's, our audit opinion is not modified in that respect of this matter particularly. So if I can then take you on to the significant issues arising during the audit and the section on uncorrected misstatements. Uh, we had one uncorrected misstatement during the year. This related to uh, donated personal protective equipment. Welsh Government and the, uh, the Health Body Service was issuing of items of personal protective equipment to all local government bodies during COVID-19 free of charge. Now, ultimately, those were being distributed to schools, residential homes, other services to be given out. And uh, basically, uh, there's been no accounting in the financial statements for this year for the receipt of those items. Now, in paragraph 28, we, we quote that it, we've come to the conclusion that the value of those items came up to just over two million pounds. Uh, and that that is higher than what we class as our trivial level, but not as high as our materiality level. So in those circumstances, we request the amendment to be made but the council has the right uh, to decide not to amend, uh, which is what the council has decided in these circumstances for this year. That's consistent with a number of other councils who have been in the same situation uh, because these are actually notional transactions. So the council has taken the decision not to include them because there would be a corresponding uh, income and expenditure for this amount. So it would have a nil overall impact on the financial statements in that regard. So what we would expect in that regard is in your letter of representation, just an explanation from you in writing as to why those uh, items haven't been accounted for. So the next section on corrected misstatements, we'll come on to that in Appendix 3. And then from paragraph 31, we talk about other significant issues arising from the audit. And in Exhibit 2, uh, I won't go into any of these in particular detail because I've already covered them. You've got the section on the proposed qualification in relation to the two unusable reserves, the material uncertainty clause in relation to the surplus city centre and investment property assets. And within the audit opinion, I'll come on to it in a little while, there's a summary of some of the key audit matters. When I went through the outstanding items uh, you uh, earlier, I talked about there was a need for what's called an uh, extraordinary quality control review of our audit file still to be undertaken. The reason that is, is what I'm now going to talk through in this section of the report. Under some changing regulations, the City or County of Swansea is now classed as a public interest entity because it still holds a small amount of debt which can be traded on the stock exchange. This debt is in the form of historical local bonds valued at £5,000. This being classed as a public interest entity places additional reporting requirements on us uh, and also requires us to have a, an additional uh, extraordinary quality control review of, the of our audit file because now um, the Financial Reporting Council have the authority to uh, oversee the audits of all public interest entities, which pr uh, prior to this change in regulations, they wouldn't have been able to have that authority. So this section talks about a bit of additional reporting requirements. So that you see in our audit report, a lot more word in than you'll have seen previously. And this is just trying to explain some of that. Uh, so if I can then go on to Appendix 2 then. 
I think would be the next section. So appendix one is your letter of rep. That's pretty standard stuff that we'd need from you to sign the audit opinion. So if I can just take you then to appendix two, and this is the proposed audit report. And I want to just highlight the actual wording, um, which is different from what you would have seen in previous years. And after you've got the initial sort of um, blurb and whatever, but the bit I'd like to draw your attention to is the paragraph above the second lot of bullet points where we start, in my opinion, and this is the new word in that you wouldn't see in pre would have seen in previous years, except for the possible effects of the matter described in the basis for the qualified opinion section of our report, the financial statements give a true and fair view. So what you would have had previously would have been, in my opinion, the financial statements and then go on to the next two bullet points. Now, underneath those two bullet points, there's the specific narrative around the except for the possible effects of the matter described, which we talk about here, which is the basis for the qualified audit opinion. And again, it talks about the two reserves and the potential for those to be materially misstate, misstated. Uh, if I come on to the next page, you'll also see the additional paragraph in relation to the emphasis of matter where I say I, uh, on this halfway down the page, you see I draw attention to note 14 and note 16. Uh, so that's there. And then you've got the, uh, the a little at the bottom of the next, that page, sorry, you've got key audit matters or assessment of risks of material misstatement. And there's an exhibit then on the next page, which brings forward all the risks we included when we presented our audit plan to you earlier in the year. And this now highlights uh, all of our responses to doing that work. There's nothing I need to particularly bring to your attention, but it just brings to a conclusion you know, uh, what the work we did in mitigating the risks that we highlighted when we brought your audit plan to you. And then if I can then take you finally onto Appendix 3, uh, which then is a summary of corrections made. And as in any set of financial statements I audit, you'll have the catch-all one around minor present presentational amendments, but there is one particular one which re uh, relates to uh, an adjustment to note 28 in relation to um, some of the grant income that was included in there that was uh, on an agency basis and uh, you know, uh, but that was just in the note and wasn't included in the uh, actual council's count comprehensive income and expenditure statement. That's all I have to say. Sorry, it's a bit longer than I would normally take over this sort of report, but I'm more than happy to take any questions any members have. Okay, thank you, thank you uh, Jason. Uh, it's obviously disappointing to see the qualified opinion with all the hard work that's gone in by Ben and the finance team, but I understand the technical uh, issues needed to be uh, declared and that's what's um, given the opinion. Um, I, I invite Ben to respond to that because he mentioned earlier on he went to comment. Thank you, Chair. Yes, <clears throat> um, I couldn't be more disappointed myself either given the amount of hard work. Um, I, I, I I, I do acknowledge the Auditor General and his staff are entitled to their opinions and will form their opinion uh, uh, accordingly. So I have no professional issue with that. It's more a matter, I think, of professional pride more than anything and an overall frustration. But I think Mr Garcia has rightly contextualised appropriately the, the technical nature and the, the nil effect nature. The five items that were referred to, just to give you some context, the materiality uncertainty on assets was the same as last year. And as Mr Garcia has said, many authorities have had have had that. The agency one, I think, is a construct as a result of the rapid COVID rollout and all authorities wrestled a bit with what was agency versus principal. And that's not surprising. There were some views and adjustments <coughs> made. The the one on the bonds is uh, a, an equal frustrating annoyance. I mean, I would emphasise could theoretically be traded on the stock exchange. Mr Garcia is quite right. This this stuff was issued, I think, in 1872. It was 800 grand. All bar five, five grand was, re, was redeemed. In theory, someone could present with their bond and say we want our bit of money back. There have been no market transactions for at least the last five years. So no one could actually trade it because there's no one to match a bargain with. 
But um, it's it's in there in terms of that disclosure because theoretically the bondholders need to have as much assurance that they know that we've, we've done anything with their bonds. So that's a that's an annoying irritation. And my intention on that one is to formally write to the London Stock Exchange and ask for a formal delisting. It couldn't be done at the point at which it was raised because it's got to go in a gazette and be there for 20 working days. But it may as well be removed from the listing to hopefully remove that that obligation if the London Stock Exchange so agrees and no one no one objects. The interesting one for me was the PPE one. I mean, I'll start with that one before I go to the unusable reserves. Um, many authorities had exactly the same. And in the midst of COVID chaos, we just shoveled stuff out like everyone else. And um, two million quid in the scheme of things. I couldn't be bothered to redo the accounts. I'm being slightly deliberately tongue in cheek. I mean, it's a major effort to do the accounts once, let alone twice, let alone three times. And it, in the midst of prioritising our staff safety, the public safety, I really didn't care less about what was where and what was elsewhere and that's why i think most authorities are in the same position but again the auditor general and his staff quite rightly have indicated it is more than a trivial sum it's a matter that affects a, a whole raft of authorities and they've had similar issues with other with with health boards and, and one in particular which was holding large amounts of stocks which became very very material the reason i refer to that one is because we've agreed the position on that one we've got to a sum certain and we've agreed look it's not it's not above a threshold that requires me to change it so i'm not going to it doesn't materially affect the reader's understanding of the accounts. The one that which is the technical qualification is the issue and it's that unusable reserves. What normally happens is we have a whole raft of things that the auditor has a view on and I have a view on. Many of these things are estimates rather than actual assumptions or definitively uh, sums. Um, and in normal circumstances, we normally agree a figure. And if we could agree a figure, we'd put it through the accounts and we'd have avoided a qualification entirely. As Mr. Garcia has referred to, I've got 10 years worth of stuff to unpick here and it will have to be unpicked to come to a view as to a figure. You probably couldn't have a worse set of two transactions to try and unpick and go back 10 years because every year you're supposed to revalue. You've got depreciation and a whole raft of other things going on. Um, I to to I I mean I passed reference to it previously as a jam jar locked in out of space with a padlock on. You know there are other analogies I could give. I I, I tread carefully because I don't want to denigrate the, the 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 view given by the auditor general. Clearly, it is a material sum. Uh, they think it's over the nine million pound mark, um, and I am professionally bound by my audit by my code of practice. I could have just put a balance sheet in with just the unusable reserves on in single line. But because of the size of them, I would have had to still disclose the notes. And because we couldn't agree whether it was naught pounds, 10 million, 20 million, 30, 40, 50, we couldn't agree a sum. That's the only reason I couldn't put the entry in. I am pleased that the auditors, Auditor General and his staff have recognised the nil nature of it. I, 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 I sort of boil it down to, and this is a very throwaway comment, and it's not meant to be quite as throwaway as it sent, sounds, but it's probably best for the average reader of the accounts, because does this really, does this matter make it more or less certain that people understand what's going on? This is the metaphorical equivalent of us agreeing we've got a 20 pound, we've got 20 quid in our back pocket to spend on something. This is an argument as to whether it's a 20 pound note or two tenors. You know, in terms of boiling it down to a simple level, it's not as simple as that from a professional point of view. And I'm sure Mr. Garcia will will recognise. I don't quite mean it in that in that sense, because nine million pound in an audit qualification is still a significant matter to draw your to your attention. But because it has no overall effect, is why I use that analogy. It's like the split between two. We agree it's 20 quid or in this case, a billion pounds on those two two reserves. It's what's the split between them. And the reality is resolving it will take time and effort and will still be an estimate these two technical reserves, I had the joys back in 1995 of doing the first time that local authority accounts were meant to look like the real world. Before that, we only showed unfinanced spend in the balance sheet. It was meant to make our accounts look like normal accounts. And there was a set of entries done at the time that had a capital financing reserve and a fixed asset restatement reserve. That was scrapped in 2007 and replaced with these two, which on their creation in 2007, rolled up one of them as an estimate figure and slapped it in one of the two reserves. So it's gonna be an estimate anyway, but the solution is for us to agree that it is a reasonable estimate and one that we are both comfortable with in terms of making the adjustment. If I could have got to an agreement with my auditor colleagues, I would have done so because it would have made this debate a lot shorter uh, and I'm sure we will get to a figure. But as Mr. Garcia has alluded to, there's more work to be done to try and have sufficient certainty over what the estimated adjustment is between between the two entries. We had a number of interesting discussions. And whilst I respect the Auditor General's 
any staff's view and I am frustrated about it. I am pleased that we have an open and constructive dialogue on all matters and we respect each other's professional opinion on it. So I would pay tribute to the Auditor General's staff recognising the difficult position it places me in, um, but also very helpfully explained the overall context. And uh, I think the same will be made in the next report on the agenda. So I would want to thank Jason in particular for that, albeit I'd rather I didn't have to have this conversation with you today. But I hope overall you are assured from what both the auditor and myself have said that this has no impact. It is professionally important, but it is one of those abstract debates rather than something that is fundamentally important. I give my final analogy. If the auditor was turning up and saying nine million pounds of cash was missing, if the auditor was turning up and saying I'd misstated the surplus by nine million pounds, I would be much more upset than an argument over two very, very abstract entries in a billion pounds worth of locked in a jam jar in outer space reserves. So thank you for letting me say my, my piece, Chair, but I wanted to give some important context because I think that's probably quite important for, for wider observers of what this matter is. Thank you, Ben. I mean, moving forward, it's something that will need to be resolved, you know, during this next 12 months. Otherwise, next year we'll be we facing another qualified opinion. So, you know, I'm aware that there's a resource issue around bottoming out the issue. Um, and I, uh, you know, the sooner that's done, the better, really, albeit the pressure on the staff is, is acknowledged as well. Uh, I've got a couple of pairs of hands. So, the leader, do you want to go first? Yeah, Chair, it was just on that point, really. I mean, look, uh, Mr Smith uh, has said that um, were he able to have the time uh, to to have uh, corrected this in the short time between getting these accounts ready and, and visiting the committee, then he obviously would, would have tried to do so. But as Mr Smith also pointed out very politely earlier, we've seen a massive upsurge in the amount of unleave taken, uh, a leave not taken by staff, including Mr Smith's own finance staff. And I have to say, as, as leader of the authority, I'm sure members will agree with me, we are looking after the welfare of our staff. So um, and given that we have an abstract um, disagreement between the auditor and the council on, on accounts, on part of the accounts that really don't technically matter that much, which will be rectified before next year, Mr Smith has given that commitment. Uh, you know, I, I would ask that the committee um, be a bit more pragmatic in terms of uh, ensuring that staff get the time to recharge their batteries get the ch chance to take a little bit of leave and then do what's necessary to make sure that these accounts uh, and that issue is resolved before next year. Um, I couldn't be prouder of the work that our staff have done. I mean, you, you may be aware, Chair, that we are up again this year for uh, for Council of the Year in the UK, one of seven councils shortlisted. And that is down to the efforts of people like Ben Smith and the people in the finance team. Um, they go over and above. So, you know, I, I know Mr Garcia and uh, the auditors have a job to do and it is right that they po point out technical uh, issues. But as Mr Smith has eloquently pointed out, this is not one that should be of huge concern to the committee. It will be resolved. And from, from my political view on this, uh, I am absolutely uh, on the same page as Mr Smith. And I have to say, you know, our focus throughout this pandemic has been looking at the numbers that really do matter. And that's making sure that people get the PPE they require, people get the support they require, and that our communities are protected so that people don't succumb to this terrible virus. Those are the numbers that have been concerning us over the last 12 months. So thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to, to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, if I can move to Councillor Rayner. Thank you. Yes, uh, a very interesting read. As always, when um, issues are raised, your attention is drawn straight to them. But I don't think this has to be seen in the context of the overall set of papers before us today. That clearly shows Swansea Council is in a healthy position. It appears to the assessment of sustainability, which we'll go on to next. It's very positive and in terms of managing anything we borrow Mr Smith and his team must be congratulated for keeping this repayment system very low and under control. On the issue of the valuation of assets yes they clearly need doing and we have to thank the auditors for drawing our attention to uh, this issue. I do wonder if this is a um, an impact 
coming from the number of English councils which ran into difficulties where the issues of financial soundness had been neglected because misvaluation of assets had not been addressed properly. I think Swansea Council is lucky it does not have large shopping centres or shopping malls it's trying to sell. Clearly we need to look at city centre assets because at the moment the market is going up and down because nobody knows what the situation will be in the next few years in terms of working at home or even the suggestion in Wales that we should set up sort of localised hubs to stop people having to travel into city centres. Um, the depreciation of some of the assets is really, really difficult to go through. And I think um, both the leader and Ben Smith have clearly said our staff have got other priorities at the present time. I do think it's going to be difficult to resolve this in 12 months because we are in quite a volatile market in terms of property assets. So anything we come up with will be very much a snapshot of what's there on the day. Um, but clearly we need to address this because the auditors, auditors have brought it to our attention. I think the PPE, it's a relatively small sum, I guess. And I know, for instance, we had PPE first off coming out to special teaching facilities and then there'd be further tranches going out to whole school. Was that duplicating what had gone out already? To be quite honest, we were getting through PPE so quickly in the early months. Uh, I think these sums fall into, um, shall we say, the best practice we were following at the time. So I don't think we need to get too het up about that. So very interesting reading this report and listening to Mr Garcia's taking us through it. All in all, I think when we've gone through this very time consuming exercise, as has been made clear, it will not substantially affect the sustainability and good practice of the council's financial management. But thank you for drawing it to our attention and I hope there are extra guidelines how we assess some of these properties in this very changing circumstances. Thank you. Councillor Rayner. Ben, do you want to comment? Yes, by way of clarification and also to recognise the, the Auditor General and his staff's position, that, that matter in terms of material uncertainty on assets, they are reporting what my own officers elsewhere have drawn attention to. It is very much driven by COVID uncertainty over the last two years. I think Councillor Rayner is right, that risk may be there again, and if it is, it will be reported again. That's not an adjustment matter. Um, it's an interesting one because it, it, it lo leads into those other matters around when you when you revalue assets up and then you have that interesting wash into those unusable reserves. One of the one of the drivers for making our accounts look like normal accounts, as I say, was because there was a recognition that it used only bizarrely to be that the balance sheet showed what wasn't financed. If you if, if you if you funded an asset entirely out of grant or revenue, it appeared on the balance sheet as naught, even if it was worth 20 million quid. So there was a driver to make it look right. But of course, the other thing is local authorities are around for the long term. And most of our assets, when you look at them, are very unusual compared to a company. If you're a shareholder of a company, you're ultimately looking at what's the value in it if it were wound up and what's the value of those assets. Very, very few of those assets are likely to be sold. And many of them have got absolutely no value, even if there is an accounting value put on them. You know, an awful lot of our balance sheet assets are infrastructure. I use roads as the example, and I use it as another deliberately throwaway example. In theory, as money is spent on them, an asset is created and it's added to. Anyone who works in local government knows that roads are nothing but an absolute liability because you're always doing a backlog maintenance and you're always having to patch them and repair them. Um, they're only worth something if you could sell them to someone and who'd want to take on the liability. They're only worth something if you could go back to putting turnpikes on them in, in reality. Um, but a number of the other assets, like the investment properties and surplus assets, clearly are 
of more importance because they do have a, a, a disposal value. But of course, the, re the reality is they're only worth what you can get for them if you did have to sell them. And I think Councillor Rayner makes the right point that there are concerns and concerns. I don't think it was particularly driven by the stuff in England where you've got those over potentially overstretched authority. This one very much was driven by the COVID uncertainties, but I think she's absolutely right. There is likely to be ongoing material uncertainty until a stable position is found. But that one I wouldn't overly worry about. The one we must resolve is the value to be applied and the entry in the unusable reserves. I wouldn't be at all surprised if that same emphasis and matter is in next year, like it will be in a number of other authorities that have got significant numbers of surplus and investment assets. <coughs> and as Councillor Rayner has said, ours are still, whilst they're significant as a proportion of our overall asset base, they're relatively small compared to some of the districts that have ended up with billions of pounds on their balance sheet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Julie Davis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in relation to the unusable reserves, the issue is, has, um, has existed for at least 10 years and we have an annual external audit. So what is the reason for it only being highlighted this year? I will probably defer to Mr Garcia to comment further. Um, <clears throat> to some extent, it's my, my understanding is, is this year they are absolutely certain it has breached that £9.3 million threshold. Um, and it is an interesting construct at Julie, because as you say, I mean, there's been an annual opinion every year and audit teams have done it and they are signed off. But it is also the accounting convention. If it happens on your watch, it gets raised and it has to be considered. But I, I think it was this was the year that the auditors felt it was definitively more than £9.3 million. We did a number of estimates and a number of work rounds. Uh, we got close to a figure, but I, I think they felt there wasn't sufficient evidence that they could be assured even of that estimate. And it is that that has particularly triggered it this year. Um, couldn't have a worse year, having got through COVID and everything else, for this to be the year it is triggered. But clearly the Auditor General and his staff have a threshold. And I go back to the relatively flippant point I made between you'd be much more, you know, that 9.3 is any figure on the balance sheet. Doesn't matter which one it is, but it, it matters a lot if it's cash. It matters a lot if it's a profit or a surplus. It matters a lot less if it's an obscure matter, but they are obliged to report on such matters. But I think it's that. But I would hand over to Mr. Garcia if he wished to contextualise further. But I think I'm understanding it's that. This is the first year they are certain that it is out by more than 9.3 million between the two. And it's that that forces their hand. So they've they've been as kind as they can be within the straight jackets of their allowance of terminology and that's why they very helpfully contextualise the report. My concern was to make sure that the committee and anyone else who reads it in the paper or is a layperson understands how obscure and technical it is but that it is still important to put right. So if I may Chair I'd probably ask if Mr Garcia wished to comment further. Jason. Yeah thanks Ben, thanks Chair. Um, well all I, I think I will say this issue was reported for the first time probably five years ago as part of our report and Ben is right we have to come to an assessment that it's the accounts are materially correct as each year has gone by without this being corrected the error keeps growing and the more we've looked into it over this last year the more we've become more certain that the error is actually um, more than materiality the other part of this, which is you know, to be bear in mind, is you know, over the last three or four years, the council has been moving towards a new uh, bookkeeping system. Now, part of the original plans were that a new asset management system would be part of that new bookkeeping system. Unfortunately, when they've done the testing on that part of the system, the council has taken the view that it wasn't effective. And Ben may want to add more con context to that in a second. So the council has taken the decision now going forward that it's not going to have that IT based system. Now, this error would have to have been corrected as part of that up and system being up and run, made up and running. Now we're back to sort of square one in that regard, and I believe the council is going to be procuring a new IT based asset management system going forward. But at the moment, all of these entries are managed through spreadsheets, which is very manual, very labour intensive, which is causing part of the issue. But as far as the actual issue itself, it was first reported probably about five or six years ago. OK, thank you. 
Yes, if I may come back in, and to be fair to Mr Garcia, he's quite right. There have been references in previous reports to them having some concerns over the capital accounting and it being held together with spreadsheets, and that the management response has for the last couple of years been that we would rebase it when we implemented Oracle. He is absolutely right. Because of the very, I mean, Oracle is a large, well-implemented across many industries, um, uh, enterprise solution, but we come back with a fundamental problem that local government capital accounts are weird still compared to the real world. We have a balance sheet that looks like a, a, a company balance sheet with assets which are revalued and written to the revaluation reserve and which are depreciated and depreciation is charged to the revenue account. The problem is that entirely contradicts with the law. Local Government Finance Act and Local Government Housing Act 1989 and others prescribe that the way we charge to revenue is to have what are called minimum revenue provision charges and other items, and Oracle can't do that. So you would be back to having bits stuck together with sticky tape. So the Oracle solution is not going to work. So to be fair to Mr Garcia, the auditors, have, I, I, I mean, I've been in Section 115 for the last three years, and I do recall it that, you know, there was reference to it, and that I think the auditors were prepared to stay their hand if we were going to go through a restatement and reopening entries, a bit like it's a mini version of what happened in 2007 on creation of both the capital adjustment account and the revaluation reserve, which, as I alluded to earlier, were themselves artificial constructs. Um, no one actually knows the real value on any of those entries because those were based on um, the, the, the value on the fixed asset restatement reserve was just automatically rolled into the capital adjustment account because that's what the rules were. It was a construct that was agreed with my institute that all authorities did. And of course, I go back to 1995 when we first had to create proper looking balance sheets with fixed assets on as a young junior officer at the time doing it for the first time. That included every asset we'd ever inherited from hundreds of years worth of predecessor authorities. And I could regale you the tales of going to the to the the property department and having descriptions like land at the known end of Swampy's Swampy's Lane, known as Old Man's Wart, parcel of lands marked X three miles from where the crow flies, trying to create all of those. And it, it does compound and compound and compound. So I, I so it, it, it is an artificial construct and it is one that we would have drawn a new line under and we will have to draw a new line under it. I am utterly ambivalent as to what the entry is in the capital adjustment account or the revaluation reserve. I frankly do not care if it's naught or it's the whole £360 million. But what I do care about is making sure that both the auditor and I can agree a sum that is reasonable for both of us to put through the books. I can't just make an entry up. And I think that's that that that's the issue. But Mr. Garcia is right to contextualise that the matter was drawn to attention, but it was in the way that the 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 asset register was held together rather than getting to that threshold. I think it's just a combination of the two: Oracle delays, COVID, and the the fact that we've had to go for, go for another option has just worn us out of time and compounded it with just the sheer scale of it. You've seen with you know another couple of hundred million pounds added to the balance sheet, and the. Uh, two reserves have now grown to a billion pounds. They could be 99% right and still 100% wrong as far as the auditor's opinion is because 1% error on a billion is 10 million and is automatically above that threshold. So I think Mr Garcia was right to, to, to mention that it has been referenced before. It's just never been referenced in this context of it resulting in a qualification on the value ascribed to those two transactions. Okay. Um, Councillor Leslie Watson. Thanks, Chair. I just really want to make the observation that I think um, the decision to uh, give a qualified answer, uh, absolutely right as far as all the rules of uh, Welsh audit go, but I think it's so unfortunate. It doesn't really think, I believe, give a, a true reflection of the accounts that have been brought to us today and I do feel totally for Ben and his department that basically by the sounds of it from all the conversation I've heard from both Jason and Ben this is down to time constraints and it could well be that in a few days time it might have been resolved but too late for this um, uh, the decision of the Welsh Audit Office. I think it's very unfortunate but um, uh, we are where we are. Thank you.
I, I think if I can come in very rapidly, Chair, I mean, uh, I thank Councillor Walton and I think she's right on almost absolutely everything she has said there. I share those. The reality is we were probably more like six months away from resolving it because it's 10 years worth. I mean, normal convention is you keep six plus one years worth of accounts going all that way back. The auditors did offer me the opportunity to extend the process. So it then meant we were technically late with the accounts. Jason and I had many intense discussions and we felt we got to a point we had a line in the sand where we felt we had to draw stumps and it, it's going to be more it's going to be months worth of work and again to be fair to my audit colleagues they 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 will explore with me providing some help and support in terms of resourcing if that's appropriate ultimately it's my decision and my stuff have to do the work and it'll be subject to some Chinese walls and those sorts of bits and pieces but they they are working with us to try and resolve it but it was always going to be many many months worth of work to resolve accumulated 10-year issue and that's why we've had to draw stumps but as you rightly say Councillor Walton it ends up with a, a, a rather depressing outcome in one sense but I would again acknowledge the Auditor General and his staff have at least tried to contextualise it with the, with the parameters they've got to work with. I mean, if I can answer that, I've had a, a, a private word with Jason before the meeting yesterday, and it, you know, I have to say auditors don't take pleasure in issuing a qualified opinion, particularly when they recognise all the, the work that's been done by Ben and the team. And also, I think it's really helpful to have the final report on the agenda, which paints a very beautiful picture of the way Swansea's managed. Um, that the business during that period of time. Um, so, if I could say no more on that, I move to, to uh, Terry Hennigan, Councillor Her Hennigan. We're going to say um, this, I welcome the new um, asset management team. Um, I've raised this regarding um, assets of the council, mainly through the housing revenue account. The assets of the housing revenue account, the properties, the council houses and the land, and I can go back 10, 15 years of asking about this. So I welcome the new team, but it's something that we needed to know back then because the housing revenue recovery was in debt for under 40 million pounds, and it was important that we what, what assets we had. It was difficult getting any answers at the time. Um, I think it gets more answers now than I've ever had, so I'm quite happy about things. But this isn't something that's happened overnight. This has been going on for quite a while. And I welcome the new asset management team. And no doubt I'll ask them again, you know, what kind of assets you have when you come to God, land, properties, and council houses. Because they're going to go up again because we've got more council houses, so more assets. Thank you, Councillor Heidegger. Um, Councillor Jason Hall. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there's no question. I'd like to thank uh, Jason for bringing this to our attention. But I would also like to say to Ben, uh, thank you for your, your honesty in your reports, but I'm sure that you will get to the bon bottom of, of this at the end uh, when you reinvestigate and your team. Thank you, Ben, for all your hard work and you, Jason. Um, for fetching it to us, but I'm sure I've got every confidence in Ben and his team to uh, sort this out in the near future. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more hands up. No? Okay. Again, this report is for noting. Um, just again, you know, it is a di disappointment for, for Ben to receive this. I'm well aware of that. Um, but we need to look at the positives and moving on to the next the next report will certainly change the the picture quite dramatically. I thank Jason for the discussion we had yesterday. Uh, I appreciate that the, the rules are the rules and that has to be disclosed. It's not something that you wanted to do and it's not something the council wanted to receive. But we are where we are and I know you're both intent on finding a way forward with the resolution to, to bottom this out uh, during the course of the next 12 months, hopefully. Um, so it's again for noting, and I'm sure this will go to the full council and there may even be more discussion around that with all the council members in the play. Um, if we could take the final item then, um, this is a delightful paper to end the meeting on. Um, so Jason again, if you could take us through this paper. Absolutely, thank you Chair. 
so what you should have now in front of you, uh, our financial sustainability <laughs> assessment um, that we've undertaken over the last few months. This is part of a national piece of work we've done at all councils. And going forward, there will be a national report that you, you, know, you will see sight of, which will highlight some trends at a national level. You know, I've uh, I previously presented a version of this report to this committee, you know, and this is a far more positive your know, report than the one we issued back then, which highlights the, the direction of travel over the last sort of year or so in relation to the financial position the council sees itself within. So if I can just take you forward to the overall heading on this report, where it says the council is well placed to maintain its financial sustainability and plans to strengthen some aspects of its financial management. There was a number of different sections we looked uh, at in this report, and I'll go through some of the highlights here. So the first one section, if I can take you over to page, let's have a look, page five of the report. So the first section was that the immediate impact of COVID-19 on the council's financial sustainability has been mitigated by additional Welsh government funding. Ben and his presentation talked about the you know the funds coming into the accounts, the impact on reserves, you know, and it paragraph seven sort of highlights what we found the last time we did this piece of work, you know, so that's an interesting context. And then exhibit one just shows, as highlighted by Ben in his presentation on the accounts, that the vast majority of fun, uh, sort of additional costs as a result of COVID-19. So you've got 37 million of additional costs as a result of COVID-19, a loss of income of 22 million coming to an impact of 57 million. And then the cost in 2021 to the council was a, a, about 2 million with the rest being funded from additional funding from Welsh government. So the next section of the report on page six, uh, Head in there talks about the council's revised both its transformation strategy document and medium term financial plan supported by new governance arrangements. Again, there's a section what we reported last time. Uh, and then you've got uh, some information around a new structure of new committees being set up to monitor, you know, ultimately uh, the achievement of the medium term financial plan and the achieving better together strategy document uh, and the required efficiency savings and how they're going to be monitored. You know, ultimately uh, the third, the third, no, the second bullet point under paragraph eight talks about the council projecting a funding gap in the period 2020. 23 to 25, 26 of 20.8 million. You know, so ultimately, those are the sort of savings the council is going to have to find you know, in that period. And ultimately, you can see that broken down by each year in Exhibit 2, showing you know, for 2022, 23, it's 4.4, 23, 24, 4.1, 24, 25, 7.1, and then 25, 26, 5.2. You know, so. Uh, I think I'd also just like to above that uh, exhibit, just highlight, you know, that these new practices very much welcomed, you know, they need to be embedded, you know, and ultimately, you know, going forward, the council needs to review these revised arrangements just to ensure that they continue to be effective at delivering the aims of both the Achieving Better Together strategy and the medium term financial plan. So the next section is specifically on reserves, and we've talked a lot on reserves today. And as you won't be surprised to see, we comment the council has significantly improved its level of usable reserves. Uh, and I, I won't go into any detail here. We've it's all been highlighted that generally in this you know current year, uh, it's gone up by 50, 50 million. And that's been mentioned time and again during this meeting today. And Exhibit Three, you know, uh, shows the breakdown of those sort of reserves in comparison to your cost of services expenditure, your net cost of services expenditure. And you can see under 2021 how much uh, they they have increased up to 144.5 million, which is basically your year mark reserve figure of 134, and your general fund of 20. Oh, sorry, of 10 million. Sorry. And that comes at a 34.5% of your net cost of services. So very healthy you know, position. And the key now going forward is, as has been alluded to in this meeting, maximising the, you know, the impact those reserves can have you know, on the council going forward. So going on to the next section, you know, another very, very positive heading. The council has delivered significant service underspends during 2021. Uh, which is very, very different to what we found when we last did 
this piece of work. You know, paragraph 18 talks about uh, what, how we reached the conclusion we did last time we did the piece of work. But then paragraph 19 shows that services in 2021 delivered 20.5 million pound underspends, and you can see the bullets how that is split. Um, exhibit four then goes shows again, you know, the surpluses and and uh, overspends relating to the net revenue budget, and you know you can see that this year now, you know, or well, the last few years have been small surpluses increased into a 2.4 million surplus uh, against the net revenue budget. But that also takes into account, obviously, the transfers into reserves as well. Uh, the next section then um, about monitoring savings. Ultimately, you know, again, the impact of COVID-19 on us all and the ways of working has had to make us prioritise in relation to, you know, uh, what we can do and what we can't do. And ultimately, paragraph 24 does talk about that during 2021, the council stopped monitoring its achievements of planned savings, you know, uh, and that the medium term for planned approved by Council on the 4th of March, identified this 20.8 gap. And going forward, you know, the Council will need to monitor that, you know, these efficiency savings that are required are achieved to avoid, you know, uh, using perhaps some of these reserves to balance its budget, which is something that, uh, you know, has happened in previous years. Uh, again, uh, Exhibit 5 talks about, you know, the planned savings and the achieved savings, but with this new structure that is in place on monitoring this, hopefully that can become embedded and going forward, we can see the, you know, a higher percentage of achieved uh, savings against what was planned. And then the last section of the report talks about the council's liquidity position, and this is um, basically more about their cash. You know, can they pay their bills? Do they have enough cash to cover their commitments and liabilities as they fall due? And a, another positive statement, the council's liquidity position is sound, enabling it to meet its financial obligations when they fall due. And I'll just take you straight to exhibit six, which basically shows that, you know, for the 1920, for example, the current assets were 213 million, current liabilities were 74.5 million. So you had a liquidity ratio of 2.9, which is basically Basically, your current assets more than covered your liabilities. So a very healthy position in relation to liquidity. Uh, as I said, there will be a national report following on for this, which I'm sure this committee would like to see at some point when it comes out. But that's all I have to say on this particular report, a much more positive report and uh, uh, very pleasing and uh, happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, Jason. Ben? Yes, just very briefly, Chair. Yes, a, a more positive report to end on. And uh, in, in my view, it's about as good as it gets. Um, a report that has no recommendations for improvement from the auditor, some observations, some helpful observations in terms of our relative strength. And I am looking forward to the national report because the equivalent national report last year we fared very well in. And uh, I suspect we will fare very, very well again on that, as Jason has alluded to, with some of the comparators. We have strong cash positions. We've strengthened significantly our reserves. Many authorities will have strengthened their reserves as a result of those timing issues and the support from Welsh Government. But I am still secretly hoping that I've added the most to reserves of any of the other 21 treasurers because I'm a competitive little so and so on occasion. Um, a couple of others, I think, from Talkington have added 20 or 30 million in the equivalent last year. We we had 16 million, which was about 70% of the national ad. It won't be quite that extreme this time, but uh, it, uh, my view is it's as good as it gets in terms of an audit uh, uh, report. And having had to take my punishment with the previous one, I am going to indulge myself a little bit on this one without being overly smug, because there's always, as, as is in the report, there are things for us to uh, improve on and focus on. We're not out of the woods yet. There are pressures to be had. I've looked at every single one that's been published so far, and all the other ones I've found have had some recommendations. So I take that as a badge of honour that there are no recommendations in this one. And as I say, I'm looking forward to the overall overall contextual national report because I think there is much for my staff, all officers, all of my colleagues to be proud of and this council to be proud of in terms of its position. When we came into COVID and the reports you had in year where I, like 21 other treasurers, were flying by the utter seat of our pants and stumping up money we didn't know whether we had. I did make the point that we were cash rich at the time and at the end of the day I don't think anyone could have foreseen this sort of level of um, outturn position and it's reinforced by the auditor's very very positive comments so um 
Uh, an audit report I was pleased to receive and pleased for Mr. Doug the Garcia to present to committee. And I'm sure there will be much comment in due course when the national report is out. But um, I'm, 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 I'm aspiring for the gold medal position in that table, given the Paralympics have started today and we've just had the Olympics. Absolutely, absolutely right, uh, Ben. I'm, I'm just grateful for the Auditor General's report to include reference to the improvement in governance arrangements. Because as members of the committee know, we've been pushing to strengthen the governance arrangements and Adam has brought a number of papers during the last 12 months to the committee outlining what the council's expectations were and plans were. So I, I'm very pleased to, that you've cited those improvements. Uh, so thank you for that, Jason. Um, Councillor Clive Lloyd. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Very, very briefly, it's just a simple observation, I guess, really, from all this. Um, uh, yeah, a really strong position. A reference has been made uh, a number of times about the, the uh, excellent state of reserves. Uh, Jason re referred to previous reports, and I can remember, uh, you know, in previous years, um, Welsh audit reports come in, uh, come in to us where um, we've been in really difficult circumstances. And uh, he did mention that in previous years we may have had to dip into our reserves to to balance the books. And I know that we've we've done that, and it's been a really really difficult decision. But I think. What this whole meeting proves really is if councils are properly funded, they can be relied upon to spend wisely, to prioritise in, in, uh, in the interests of their residents and can be relied upon to, to, to deliver uh, and, and manage money prudently. So um, it's a simple message. Previous years, we've been uh, we've had more or less 10 years of austerity where we've uh, had to find other ways of making savings and efficiencies. Um, where we've had a year where we've, and I'm not expecting for one minute that we're going to have funding of this level in uh, in future years. Uh, uh, ben, you know, we've been down that road before, and that, uh, and we do have to prepare for um, uh, eventualities of uh, of reductions in funding in future years, given where we're coming out of uh, and government debt. But you know, the simple message is, if councils are properly funded, they can manage the money and they can deliver. So let's have properly funded local government. Thank you. Thank you, Claire Clive. OK, that brings the, 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 the meeting to a close. So can I thank everybody again for their um, contributions to the meeting? And also, again, Ben, compliments to you and the team. And uh, thanks to you as well, Jason, for the support you've been giving to the team through the audit process. So after no other hands, there, no other comments. So I will now bring the meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.